merely that they don't trust one another. They don't even trust themselves. If they're not sure when someone else may turn and kill them, they are still less sure when they may turn and kill themselves. They cannot trust anything because they have ceased to believe in God. It's not only our hatred of others that is dangerous, but also above all, our hatred of ourselves. Particularly that hatred of ourselves, which is too deep, too powerful to be consciously faced. For it is this which makes us see our own evil in others and unable to see it in ourselves. So, so what he's saying is that we're, it's psychological projection. You know, we're, we're projecting evil out we're actually hating ourselves, but what we project it out to others as a, as a uh, defense mechanism. That's how I would put it, psychologically. When we see crime in others, we try to correct it by destroying them, or at least putting them out of sight. It's easy to identify the sin with the sinner when he is someone other than our own self. In ourselves, it's the other way around. We see the sin but we have great difficulty in shouldering responsibility for it. We find it very hard to identify our sin with our own will and our own malice. On the contrary, we naturally tend to interpret our immoral act as an involuntary mistake, or as the malice of a spirit in us that is other than ourselves. Yet, at the same time, we are fully aware that others do not make this convenient distinction for us. The acts that have been done by us are in their eyes our acts, and they hold us fully responsible. What is more, we tend unconsciously to ease ourselves still more of the burden of guilt that is in us by passing it on to someone else. When I have done wrong and have excused myself by attributing the wrong to another who is unaccountably in me, my conscience is not yet satisfied. There is still too much left to be explained. The other in myself is too close to home. The temptation is then to account for my fault by seeing an equivalent amount of evil in someone else. Hence, I minimize my own sins and compensate for doing so by exaggerating the faults of others. As if this were not enough, I mean, he really does ramp this up to war. Um, we make the situation much worse by artificially intensifying our sense of evil and by increasing our propensity to feel guilt even for things which are not in themselves wrong. So we become scrupulous. We start to name things wrongly. In all these ways, we build up such an obsession with evil, both in ourselves and others, that we waste all our mental energy trying to account for this evil, to punish it, to exercise it, or to get rid of it any way we can. We drive ourselves mad with our preoccupation. And in the end, there is no outlet left but violence. You get, the, you get the picture of what Merton's yeah. stacking up here? We have to destroy something or someone. By that time, we have created for ourselves a suitable enemy, a scapegoat in whom we've invested all the evil in the world. He's the cause of every wrong. He's the fomenter of all conflict. If he can only be destroyed, conflict will cease. Evil will be done with. There will be no more war. This kind of fictional thinking, he goes on, is especially dangerous when it's supported by a whole elaborate pseudo-scientific structure of myths, like those which Marxists have adopted as their air stats for religion, but is certainly no less dangerous when it operates in the vague, fluid, confused, and unprincipled opportunism which substitutes in the West for religion, for philosophy, and even for mature thought. <laughs> see, see what he's doing there? He's he's got the measure of Catholic tradition here, and he's he's using it for vengeance. It goes on. When the world is in moral confusion, when no one knows any longer what to think, and when in fact everybody's running away from the responsibility of thinking, and that, that yeah, does that sound familiar? Everybody's running away from the responsibility of thinking. When man makes rational thought about moral issues absurd by exiling himself entirely from reality and into the realm of fictions. I mean, I mean, that sounds like a description of what I see around me in society, by the way. 
and when he expends all his effort in constructing more fictions with which to account for his ethical failures, then it becomes clear that the world cannot be saved from global war and global destruction by mere efforts and good intentions of peacemakers. In actual fact, everyone is becoming more and more aware of the widening gulf between good purposes and bad results, between efforts to make peace and the growing likelihood of war. It seems that no matter how elaborate and careful the planning, all attempts at international dialogue end in more and more ludicrous failures. In the end, no one has any more faith in those who even attempt the dialogue. On the contrary, the negotiators, with all their pathetic goodwill, become the objects of contempt and of hatred. It is the men of goodwill, the men who have made their poor efforts to do something about peace, who will in the end be the most mercilessly reviled, crushed, and destroyed as the victims of the universal self-hate of man when they have unfortunately only increased by the failure of their good intentions. Scary. But he doesn't give up. There's still hope, friends. Perhaps we still have a basically superstitious tendency to associate failure with dishonesty and guilt, failure being interpreted as punishment. Even if a man starts out with good intentions, if he fails, we tend to think he was somehow at fault. If he was not guilty, he was at least wrong. And being wrong is something we have not yet learned to face with equanimity and understanding. We, this is interesting. We either condemn it with godlike disdain or forgive it with godlike condescension. We do not manage to accept it with human compassion, humility, and identification. See what he's doing? He, uh, he's shifting the, the focus to compassion. Thus, we never see the one truth that would help us begin to solve our ethical and political problems, that we are all more or less wrong, that we are all at fault, all limited and obstructed by our mixed motives, our self-deception, our greed, our self-righteousness, and our tendency to aggressivity and hypocrisy. It goes on. It's our refusal to accept the partially good intentions of others and work with them, of course prudently, and with resignation to the inevitable perfections of the result. We are unconsciously proclaiming our own malice, our own intolerance, our own lack of realism, our own ethical and political quackery. Is that something? Perhaps in the end, the first real step toward peace would be a realistic acceptance of the fact that our political ideals are perhaps to a great extent illusions and fictions to which we cling out of motives that are not always perfectly honest. That because of this, we prevent ourselves from seeing any good or any practical, practicability in the political ideals of our enemies, which may of course be in many ways even more illusory and dishonest than our own. We will never get anywhere unless we can accept the fact that politics is an inextricable tangle of good and evil motives in which perhaps the evil predominate, but where one must continue to hope doggedly in what little good can still be found. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of it because you get the feel. Merton continues to hope doggedly in his little efforts. Where was that from? Oh, that's from Seeds of Contemplation, Chapter 16, The Root of War is Fear. So you can look at that in that, in that thing. But you see, he continues to hope doggedly. He holds on to hope in the face of the unspeakable. He is not giving up. And that's the gift Merton left with us. He never gave up on his gifts. And I wanted to say, every one of you has gifts. I know this, I know you, some of you have just met, but the ones I know personally, you all have gifts to offer this struggle. And the issue being, what we're going to do is we're going to try to push our gifts to the pedal to the metal with the gifts that God has given us, like Merton did. And that, that seems to be the, uh, the, the ultimate conclusion of the talk. Yeah. 
Sorry, did you say something about the mass media in the groups? Yeah, the mass media. Can you give a reference for that? Yeah, I can give the references. I won't do any reading. Um, but there's some beautiful sections on the mass media. If you go to 90, uh, I read that one, uh, 90, 91, 92 uh, of uh, Peace in the Post-Christian Era. Let me, let me get the other. Pages? Yeah. There's three pages in that. Paragraph 90, 91, and 92, right? Page. Actually, paragraph 90 of Pacham and Terrace, page 90, 91, 92, this is synchronicity of peace in the post-Christian era by Merton. Now, I'll give you some other references just so that you can look these up. In nonviolence, uh, uh, this is the book, it's called non Faith and Violence. Um, by Merton. It was written in 68. He's got a section on the Kennedy assassination in the media that's particularly good at page 30 and following in this book, Faith and Violence. And, um, I'm sorry, the, you want his account of hope in the face of the unspeakable? Go to the book Raids on the Unspeakable, page 2, 3, Four, five, six. Two through six. Amazon. Uh, Merton's account of hope in the face of the unspeakable is in page two to six of his book, Reads, Reads on the Unspeakable. Okay? And uh, one more thing on the media that I thought was particularly good was his defense of Pope John the 23rd, paragraph 90, he mentions it too. Um, if you go uh, Seas of Destruction, page 102, 103, uh, uh, 104, wait a second. Wait, be, be, uh, and then, uh, help me here, one, one more section. Uh, Anyway, he, uh, that section is the Christ, it's the, the essay is called The Christian in World Crisis, and it's that section that he got to publish uh, from that other book. Uh, right, uh, in 64. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the book. And pages two through six, Hope in the Face of the Unspeakable. Is that yeah, correct? Hope in the Face of the Unspeakable is the theme. And the title of the book is Raids on the Unspeakable. Raids? R-A-I-D-S on the Unspeakable. That's the title of the book. That's a book of parables. Uh, now, remember, the reason he wrote that book is that he wasn't allowed to talk about peace uh, and war really directly. So instead of giving up, he started his poetic intuitions and kept writing and built these elaborate, beautiful parables about the issue. And that's called Raids on the Unspeakable. I just uh, showed you that book. Here it is. Raids on the Unspeakable. This is quite a book. Uh, but it's, it, it's very challenging. And you have to be patient with the poetry and the insights. It doesn't, it doesn't come easy. But it very worth the fight. Yes. I know he had mentioned, or you had mentioned earlier, he talked about not taking, you know, this quietest, you know, approach that there's certain evils you have to right. take a stand on. But I'm still not sure exactly where he would be coming from. Um, certainly, you know, as they say, it takes two to tango. It takes two or more. Uh, to make war, or perhaps it really only takes one to make a war. Right. If someone just unilaterally you know, starts, right. uh, starts a war, then mm -hmm. you know, the, the other party or parties, are, I would argue, would have to respond in some way. Um, but how, uh, 
how do you resolve that? But he talks about how we should be full of, in essence, faith, hope, and love, and assume the best, and, and all this. But what about you have another party that's, uh, you know, hell-bent hell -bent on war and destruction, or you're just on a totally different plane than your, than your adversary in the situation, and they're not, um, right. they're not in a good spot, to say the least. And that you're approaching this from an Orthodox Christian point of view and a faith-filled response, and somebody else uh, is held down on war. I mean, how do you, how would Merton respond to something like that, especially if someone actually is aggressively slaughtering thousands, if not millions, of innocent women and children, which happened, you know, with Mao or Stalin? So what, what, how do you respond? Well, for Merton, I think it was a question of uh, ameliorating the evil. You don't, you don't add evil to the evil of a Mao. They knew Mao was evil when Merton was writing this stuff. But the unthinkable would have been to ratchet our resistance to Mao up where we didn't like what he was doing, so we just bomb him with a nuke. We ended up negotiating with him in 1972 with Nixon. That's uh, four years after Bert was killed, uh, died. I'm sorry, I'm giving away uh, another book. Don't miss this one. The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton by uh, Hugh Turley and David Martin. Um, I'm not, I, I, I mean, the jury's out as to what really happened to Merton when he died, but they made quite a case that he was martyred. What do you think? I think he was martyred. Do you? Mm -hmm. I think, think that was, the, so perhaps that fan was jury rigged in order to... No, it wasn't that the fan, the fan was a cover story, ah. according to their uh, forensics. But um, what, what, what you're dealing with, uh, I mean, let me just tell you, uh, I, was, I was sheepishly sharing this with a 92-year-old relative in Peoria. You know the old line from the Nixon thing where they said, will it play in Peoria? Well, I was eating in Peoria with a 92-year-old relative. It was in the afternoon we were having steak. And I got this pain look on my face when Thomas Merton came up. And I didn't want to say this to a 92-year-old person. And I said, I just, I'm sorry. Um, this, is, this is about how I said it. Um, I, I just read this book that said Thomas Merton was killed. Um, and, and I was oh, I was apologetic. And she said, oh, Gus, we knew about that. There was a priest from Notre Dame that came over to Peoria and told us. Well, there were priests. When he, she said from Notre Dame, in those days, there were priests studying at Notre Dame in the summer program all the time. So a priest from Notre Dame didn't mean a Holy Cross priest. It meant just somebody coming through. He came through Peoria after Merton died and said that his opinion was he was killed, not that he died by an electric fan or anything like that. And I was like, oh, you, you heard this before. Oh, yeah, she said, like, like almost matter of fact. This night, this lady's as sharp as a tack, 92, but, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, oh, okay. Like, and then she said something interesting that I think is worth pondering about that. She said, there are many things we would find out and would cause us to weep. Like that. And then she just went on with the, with the, with the lunch. I mean, it was... It, she had this wisdom, like, like, yeah, that could have happened. And we were told it in the 60s, 1969 or 70, somewhere in there. And, but we'll discover things that will cause us to weep. What year did he? He died in December 10th, 1968, right at the end of the era of assassination. So he would have been the fifth big assassination if you want to count the other four. And the argument is that, and see, I'm convinced of it not 
not so much by the forensics, because I'm not a forensic ep uh, expert, but I'm always looking for the conversion value of things. That's what I, that's my area. And Merton had, it wasn't his opposition to the war, just his opposition to the war that did him in if he was killed. It was his opposition to the media propaganda machine. And since those people who were forcing that propaganda on people were threatened by such a brilliant mind that could see through them, that's why it was killed. That's my view. So that would have been either some media executives no. or people that were paying these media executives, executives to, to, to produce to stories. The, the mighty world it's sort of thing. That the, the stories that some people uh, paid to get in the media, that was all proven by the church committee. We had, I mean, 1975. The it was proven by the church committee about Thomas Merton, you're saying? No, not about Merton. About the media interference of certain government agencies. The famous Mighty Wurlitzer. You know about the Mighty Wurlitzer? There's this uh, CIA guy who said, uh, this. he was like one of the first guys, I think in the 40s or 50s, Mighty Wurlitzer, the Wurlitzer being a, uh, a music machine. Or, yeah, or, or a music or machine. Music, yeah. Um, and he said, I can, I can crank up the Mighty Wurlitzer and play uh, these articles on, in lots of media outlets. And he, I mean, he boasted about it. So the, the Mighty Wurlitzer could produce a lot of uh, flack. And they did with Merton, by the way. Um, too. After Merton died, they, they, they relished, I think, in the idea that he had somehow become unorthodox at the end of his life. To, to separate Catholics off against him. And one of the proofs that he was orthodox is Bishop uh, Barron's, Father Barron's, before he became bishop, did a beautiful uh, lecture called The Metaphysics of Peace of Thomas Merton. And you can watch that on YouTube. Just type in Barron's Metaphysics of Peace uh, on Merton. It's a wonderful lecture. And what he does is he takes you from when Merton really converted to Catholicism through the writings of Gilson in the 1930s and follows him right up to the end of his life and shows him absolutely consistent on peace, on the issue of peace. And that's Bishop Barron's. He's, he's the most moderate, reasonable voice in Catholicism Probably right like now. like Peoria, Illinois or something. Right? Yeah, yeah, he can play in Peoria. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I'm interested in this only if it, I mean, only if ordinary people can line up the logic. I'm, I, I don't want to get into uh, curiosity and conspiracy theories, because they, they go down a rabbit hole. But on the other hand, I think we need to be honest and truthful when we look at these things and not be afraid to look at the unspeakable, even as it was, it was uh, played out of Merton. That would be my answer. Look at what Merton himself said about the unspeakable. Yeah, you're, um, okay, you um, were talking that you, have, that you had a point on Facebook. Yeah. And I, want to, I want that again. And then, because then you said, you talked afterwards about um, how Merton had foresaw the assassination. Well, it feels like with what you said there, that he almost foresaw somebody like our president now, or like politics be coming right now. Now, and I, I'd be glad to read that to you again, but I gotta tell you what my cousin did. She follows me on Facebook, mm -hmm. and, and she has political views that are a little bit more to the left of mine. Just to let you know, I love her, but she's definitely more to the left of me. And she, she said, she said, I just finished watching the Democratic debate and I wish they would have listened to Merton. That's what she said. I, 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 didn't, I was too busy preparing my Merton talk to watch the Democratic debate, but I thought it was funny. Well, she left, Williamson may have listened to Merton a little. Okay. With the staging of the event. Um, possibly. But the issue being here, um, you're, I, I've got to get the right, uh, the right quote here. But, uh, patience, patience. 
Uh, I threw it down here. Here it is. All right. This is what I wrote on Facebook. And again, what I said about it is that Merton lived this, but he also could speak it. The real issue here is not actually a moral principle so much as a state of mind. The state of mind is one which we find in the mass media. It's made up of a large number of superficial assumptions about what is going on in the world and about what is likely to happen. A state of mind is something indefinite and intangible. And for that very reason, it tends to be ignored or underestimated. One can hardly come to grips with it once it is barely reducible to discourse. And yet, that does not mean it is incommunicable. On the contrary, it spreads like fire. Now he's really concerned about it, right? It spreads like fire. It catches hold of every mind and heart. One is not protected against this moral combustion merely by rational statements of principles or of fact. Something much deeper is required. And here's where I mentioned the character of Merton, right? One must have profound and solid grounding in spiritual principles. One must uh, have a deep and persevering moral strength, a compassion, an attachment to truth and to humanity, a faith in God, an uncompromising fidelity to God's law of love. Failing this, he says, a nebulous and all-pervading state of mind will take over the role of morality and conscience and will rationalize its prejudices with convenient religious or ethical formulas. In other words, people will hide behind religious and ethical formulas but not get to the deep calling of their own conversion. That's what he's saying here, obviously to me. I mean, I'm translating this as a conversion minister, of course. Maybe someone else could read it better. But that's how I read this. He's saying the result will be a fatal turning away from truth and from justice. So that, that's the quote I put on Facebook. And the response was, one of the other responses came from a friend of mine in New Orleans who wrote back and said, this is the call to the new evangelization. He says, Merton is right about this state of mind that people live under. And they need a new awakening. I must say, I'm very interested, for example, in the phenomenon of the Logos Rising movement. It's, it's, it's happening. People are turning away from addictions. They're, they're turning away from um, uh, 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 bad moral lives. They, they want to get married. They want to uh, turn to the church. A lot of them are becoming Christian or Catholic. It's, it's called Logos Rising. You can check it on the YouTube if you care to. But what I want to say about that is that that's an example for, uh, of a sign of the times. Merton was concerned that Logos would rise. He, and he was concerned that, um, that it didn't get quenched by the lack of uh, response or virtue on the part of people, see? Or their lack of contemplation. See? And, and that, that's, that's what's at stake here. In fact, uh, one point I made about my kids is that I hope they have truth and love. I hope they have truth in love. And I know, hope they have the truth about love. Okay? Truth in love, meaning that the circle of love and knowledge is operating in their soul. The truth in love means is that what they discover in truth, they apply to the world in love. Okay? And the truth about love means that they, they understand uh, the meaning of love in terms of the revelation of the natural law and the Ten Commandments, so that they're not defining love in a sloppy way. So, so, you know, the truth and love, the truth in love, and the truth about love 
is what I was trying to give my children in these seven talks. Anything else? I mean, is that helpful with it? Yeah. All right. Was there? Good job. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. 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 And, and this is something that at least I feel, and I would imagine others do, is that um, I don't want this to be over. You don't want it to be over.